a recent video I mentioned that I had some fairly major projects coming up and this video is an introduction to the first of those. Anyone that hasn't seen one of these before, this is an Intel MDS system. Uh, MDS not to be confused with the vulnerability of the x86 Intel chips. MDS in this case stands for Microprocessor Development System. So although this looks like a large bulky PC with a built-in monitor, it is in fact a development system that Intel designed specifically to allow their processors to be designed into other systems. So the way to think of these is they are more akin to a development system for something like a microchip PIC. So this would be your in-circuit emulator for a PIC for example. Um, Intel developed their own operating systems to drive these. I will go into the details, the inner workings of them uh, as I go through the repairs and restorations. I have a number of these to look at, I think I have five in total. Uh, I would say I don't own them, uh, they belong to a museum and they've asked me to look at repairing them and restoring them. So I'm going to uh, video that process. Hopefully if you're interested in this sort of thing then you will find these videos interesting. These machines are a very important link between uh, IBM mainframes and what we, uh, what we would recognise today as uh, PCs. Uh, PCs didn't really develop directly from these, but these were very instrumental in taking development from mainframe uh, computer systems into standalone distributable computers. And that's what these were for. They weren't computers that ran um, applications in the normal sense, uh, but they were used specifically for developing systems and hence the way that the architecture within these is uh, put together is a bit unusual and in fact that architecture can make them a bit tricky to work on. Uh, I also mentioned in a previous video that I used to collect uh, old vintage equipment when I first started in electronics and I didn't mention one of these because I assume nobody had ever heard of them uh, but now I have one to show um, this is one of the first pieces of equipment I ever got my hands on. It was, com it was incomplete, it was a bare chassis. Uh, and in fact, the first bit I ever got was one of these dual drives. Um, again, no top on it, the case was broken, neither drive worked. In fact, I think it only had one drive in and, and the uh, bare chassis from another. And, and I picked it up out of a skip and I got it purely because of the components looking very interested uh, within it and we'll look inside one of the drives uh, in a minute. But the main unit, this is this dual drive is a, an add-on. Um, the basic unit is just this lower section with the keyboard. It's got a built-in um, floppy drive. So as I say, I'll go into more detail as to what's inside this as we work our way through it. But the architecture is very interesting. It's a multi-bus system. And that means that you can have uh, multiple devices all sharing resources within a system and the advantage of that of course is if you're developing a system you can attach all manner of uh, accessories to it such as uh, in-circuit emulators. This is really what this system is for but as we go through it you'll see that it's, it is of its time. It was uh, late 70s, early 80s and uh, the systems that were built around it and into it are very interesting and I'm hoping you'll find this series of video is quite, uh, quite interesting. This is of course quite a major project so it will be quite a long series. If this is not your sort of thing don't worry I will be doing these um, alongside my, my more standard um, projects. If you've used these, if you have information about them uh, or you've got any comments about them then please um, leave a comment on the video. I'm sure that other people will be very interested to learn more about these and they are very fascinating. As I say, these are a very important part of uh, computer history. And without these machines, I think the uh, propagation of uh, Intel-based systems would have been much slower. And these were very, as I say, very instrumental in springboarding uh, Intel processors into many applications. 
So we'll have a quick look at what's inside this. I won't take this apart just now. Obviously it will be taken apart and I will take my standard approach with these. Because they belong to a museum, I will have to take a fairly reverend approach to dealing with them. Uh, that is my preferred method anyway. If you've been watching my videos, you know that I generally don't get things like this and just plug them in. The first thing I do is strip them down, go through all the boards, the power supplies, and then I start reconstructing them. I do have quite a number of boards to go through with these, so one of the first steps in this series will be to build a test jig to allow me to test the boards. Uh, and then we'll go through the boards um, one by one and put together a, a test system so that we can get them up and running. By the way, I apologise for the lighting in here. I'm not in my usual lab. I'm in my office and the lighting down here is not, uh, not quite so good. OK, so in order for users to make any practical applications with these, they needed some sort of operating system. So uh, Intel developed their own operating system. We'll have a look at that uh, in another video. Uh, but it was normally distributed on floppy disks. Now, anyone that is familiar with a floppy disk, hasn't obviously been in use for a few years, most likely you've seen one of these. Of course, that doesn't fit in the drives. So if you go back a few years, we had five and a quarter. So the first one's a three and a half inch disk. This is a five and a quarter, but again, way too small disks that actually were used in these machines were 8 inch disks and as you can see they are significantly bigger than the more modern alternatives. I say more modern of course these haven't been used now for many years uh, but this is how the software uh, was distributed uh, for use on these machines uh, and again because we have these we can run the machine up properly and give it uh, a full test once we get it working. So what we have inside here is a monitor at the top, floppy drive to the right, big power supply at the back. We'll have a look at um, a floppy drive and a power supply in a minute. And then at the bottom behind this panel, there's a card rack. And in the card rack, the top card is the processor card. And what we have here, what it's saying interrupts. Because of the way this machine is um, designed and the way it's intended to be used, you can almost look at interrupts as if they are um, traps in a more modern um, development system. So what we have is the top card, so this is the processor card, and again we'll have a closer look at these once we get into the lab. Now in theory you should be able to run a machine with just this plugged in, and as you can see it plugs into a back plane that sits at the back of this slot, uh, and that's kind of what we'll be uh, creating a, a test jig from one of those boards. And then this, in theory, should be almost a standalone board. You hook it up to a floppy drive and you should be able to boot uh, or even use the um, internal ROM. But um, because it's a, a multi-bus system, there can be some complications in dealing with these and they can appear to uh, work, even though they may be flaking operation. They, it's a bit uh, difficult to explain, but I'll go over the multibus uh, operation in another video, but it does mean that you've got to take fairly uh, considered approaches to the way you go about fault finding on these. Okay, so that's the processor card. You may then have something like this. So this is a floppy drive uh, controller card. There are two versions of the floppy drive, or two main versions. I should say this is a, um, a, a two... 3-1 model number uh, machine and there were three basic levels of machine in this this range. Each of those had two subversions. So in general with these part numbering systems and the same is true of the floppy drives you have a base number so for example the floppy drive might be an 800 and that was a US version the US machines so all the base numbers are US based and if it was a 240 volt version then generally what they did is just put a 1 onto the end of the number. So if you have an 800 floppy drive then it's probably a 120 volt uh, drive. If it's a um, 801 it's probably a 240 volt drive and the same is true with the base units and the 230 was the 120 volt version and the 231 was the 240 volt version and that was the basic premise uh, 
but there was quite a few changes of, uh, of these over the years so um, you might find they got multi-voltage supplies or something like that but either way the part numbering was intended to differentiate between the two uh, basic types. Uh, but as I say this is uh, a 231 and we'll look at the internals uh, later and what card you fitted to a large degree was up to you but you did need the processor card. Okay now when it comes to the floppy drives there were two basic versions and unfortunately this was before the uh, standards were really uh, brought together so the two types are not really interchangeable um, in terms of using the same hardware. So one was a single density drive and the other was a double density drive but you couldn't just swap one for the other because they had different uh, drive requirements they were handled differently by the electronics. So if we look at uh, the first cars so if we look at this car this is a single density floppy drive controller card uh, you can see they're fairly complex uh, and again this would fit into the uh, slot behind this panel so you had single density you could use double density cards but you'd need a different card to control it this is generally speaking as I say there were a lot of changes over the years but this is kind of the fundamental configuration so you'd have a double uh, density drive and as I say they weren't 100% interchangeable but you could swap one for the other and update the system uh, you then have um, adding memory cards and again this is just a, a card that would be populated with uh, DRAM and again that goes into one of the slots on the backplane. Then on the back of the machine there's a huge interface card so there were a lot of potential interfaces as I say it's a multi-bus system so you could attach a lot of things to this and to cater for that you needed some way to do that now there were in-out cards and there was uh, this uh, multi-in-out card and again exactly how this works and what it does we'll look at in a separate video what I'll probably do is a separate video on each of these cards to fully explain their operation but, but they are interesting in their own right as to how they operate and how they're designed and it's the sort of thing that if you find electronics interesting and especially vintage electronics this is something you'll probably find very interesting um, but as you can see uh, it was quite a complex device and you could attach uh, any number of uh, different devices to it there are some damage on these uh, panels but hopefully I'll be able to tidy these up and uh, get the dents out um, but the idea is to go through these restore them uh, and get them working but as I say I have to uh, keep them intact because they don't belong to me so I need to make sure that uh, I restore them and repair them rather than make any uh, modifications. So looking inside the machine very beefy power supply uh, this provided power to all the cards and the monitor and uh, as you can see they are very huge assemblies these are really heavy huge transformer uh, big fan on the uh, end huge uh, heat sinks on the back I won't turn it around now we'll have a look at one of these um, in detail as we go through the repair and testing and I'll do separate videos for the power supplies these are mostly built around discrete linear regulators and they have um, high current pass transistors in order to give uh, high current uh, capability generally something like a 2N3055 or something of that uh, uh, of that type um, quite simple uh, but um, the problem with these is especially with this version is they're built a bit like an artichoke so you've got to peel several layers off if you want to replace certain parts and it can be a bit of a pain um, but not too bad to work on they're quite nice and open the other thing to uh, check is to make sure that obviously we don't get any issues um, with capacitors uh, going short because uh, obviously these would make quite a significant uh, pop if they went off uh, so we'll probably start with um, one of the power supplies in the next video but they are quite easy to deal with and uh, generally they're fairly reliable um, usual sort of thing you might get the occasional failed uh, uh, component um, poor joint that sort of thing but um, it's just a case of working uh, through each of the rails and making sure they can handle the current that, um, that we need um, this is also the reason I purchased the Kunkin electronic load I needed to be able to uh, leave it running to test these uh, as I mentioned in the video when I first introduced the uh, electronic load um, 
I needed it for particular projects and, and this is uh, the projects that uh, I really purchased it for. Okay, so also inside the machine we have the backplane and these have a, um, a potential fault. It's a bit like the problem you'll get with old HP machines if you're familiar with them and that the um, spring tension on the contact isn't high enough and what tends to happen is over time they'll bend away from the card and they don't put sufficient pressure on the card to make good contact and quite often what can happen is you'll get a high resistance contact and your machine will keep crashing or it won't boot or it will boot sometimes and not others. Um, there are different uh, connectors you can use of course but um, generally this is one of the, th the first things that uh, you check on a system like this. Same as you do with the HPs is make sure all the connectors are uh, making good contact uh, otherwise you could be chasing yourself running circles for days trying to track down a, a non-existent fault. OK, so we'll use this card to make um, a test jig. If we need to, we'll replace the connectors, um, but it'll be far easier testing the cards on the test jig than it will trying to do it while they're plugged into the, uh, the main chassis. And so this is one of the floppy drives. Uh, this is a NATO 1 drive, uh, and you can see a very substantial piece of equipment. Um, the motors are huge. And the lead screw for driving the head, for example, is over half an inch in diameter. Um, but very nicely made. Uh, cast aluminium chassis, very high quality motors. Um, and you can see just by looking at it that it only has a single head. You see the heads there at the bottom. This top um, pad is just a pressure pad. And um, solenoid for lifting and raising the uh, pressure on the head. And um, all in all, quite a simple devices, just a, a couple of motors and a filter for the uh, power. And then on the bottom, you have the controller card. And quite a simple card, not a great deal to these. Uh, they're very easy to work on. As I say, nicely made. There's not a great deal else to, uh, to say about this at the moment, but we will go through, we'll check everything, uh, probably take the drive out and lubricate the bearings. Um, that can be a, a potential fail point on these. Um, the bearings can start to fail and then it, it does make repairing them uh, a lot more difficult. It's far better to try to maintain them rather than wait until those fail. Other than that, it's just really cleaning it and making sure it's properly aligned. Uh, and of course, repairing any faults that we find as we go along. So, that's it for this video. Uh, just a very brief introduction to these devices. Hopefully you'll find the series of um, videos interesting. As I say, if you've got any information or advice or any questions about these, then um, please leave a comment.